this is, welcome to TPR 3. This is TPR 3 now. Be sure and write that down on your evaluation sheet. Remember, we desperately want those evaluation sheets as you leave. We'll have a box in the front and probably a person at the back. Now, you can also, once again, for the TPR track, you can leave us a business card or a piece of paper with your name written on it to be entered into the drawing for one of two of these marvelous propeller hat, propeller hats. We give two of these away on Wednesday, and the drawings come from the people who attend our tracks. So you can enter as many times as you come to a presentation in TPR. Obviously, cross-site scripting is a very big subject. That's why the room is full, and so I'm not going to delay you any longer. Paul Gilzow with cross-site scripting. Good morning. My name is Paul Gilzow. I'm with the Department of Web Communications at the University of Missouri. I'll let you know this presentation usually takes about an hour and 15 minutes. We've only got 45, so I'm going to have to talk a little bit faster. I'm going to have to ask you to hold your questions until the end, if you can. If you've got your laptops and your Twitter, you're going to create a back channel at HEW08XSS, and if you want to, you can post your questions there, and then after the presentation, we'll go back tonight and post those answers up on the news site. So just a real quick poll. How many of you have heard of cross-site scripting? Just about everybody. Okay. How many of you have a pretty good idea of what cross-site scripting is? A few more, a little bit less. How many of you actually use cross-site scripting to exploit somebody else's site? The FBI would like to see you at this presentation. How many of you have done HTML development? Pretty much everybody? Everybody's familiar with HTML code? How many of you have done some JavaScript development? All right. Good. Since some of you have heard of it but not quite really sure what it is, I'm going to kind of start at the base and kind of work our way back up. All right. So all browsers follow what's called the same origin policy. And what that means is the content in the page has to come from the same host, the same protocol, and the same port number for content to interact with each other. And this is a good thing because if you've got Facebook up and you've got your bank up, you don't want Facebook interacting with your bank's website, right? Okay. But you've probably all put maybe embedded YouTube videos on your pages. Some of you have done that? Okay, well, a YouTube video doesn't live on your server, does it? No, it's not on YouTube server. So you've actually got cross-domain content on your website. But the browser allows that because as far as it's concerned, all of that content has come from one domain. In other words, your server gave out that page with all that content, all those links, everything. So the browser says, okay, that's fine. All right, well, cross-site scripting attempts to exploit or bypass that same origin policy by injecting additional commands into any place you accept inputs. All right, so cross-site scripting is an injection attack. It usually takes the form of either HTML code, an image source or a frame or something like that, or actual script tags, and then link out to somebody else's domain, somebody else's web server, and pushes over those JavaScript files. Now, cross-site scripting is not an attack against your web server. It's not an attack against your website, and for the most part, does no damage to your website. It's an attack against your users. All right? It attempts to exploit the trust that your users have for your domain. So how many of you, I mean, everybody here is higher ed, how many of you are pretty sure that if you send a link to one of your faculty members that's on your own site, how, 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 much are, how sure are you that they're going to trust that, that link? Pretty sure, right? Because it's their school. I mean, they, they trust that their school is secure. So we're going to attempt to exploit that trust that the user has for the website to trick them into going there. Because if we can get our script, as an attacker, if we can get our script to run in the context of that page, we own the page. We can do anything we want. Cross-site scripting is usually an indication of a much larger problem. Now, it can be used as an attack in and of itself. But it's also usually combined with additional attacks, like cross-site request forgeries, clickjacking, lots of others. So we usually use it. So we, attackers usually use it as a basis <laughs> foundation. <laughs> Slip there, uh, as a basis to launch additional attacks. All right, so how prevalent is cross-site scripting? Well, in 2006, out of 12,000 sites scanned, out of all the vulnerabilities from those 12,000 sites, almost 70% were cross-site scripting. All right, so that's a big chunk of vulnerabilities out there. All right, 2007, scanned 33,000 sites, almost 70,000 vulnerabilities. And 60% of those were cross-site scripting. So we kind of come down a little bit through education and presentations such as this, but it's still a huge problem. All right, well, how prevalent is it in higher education? 
Yeah. Web App Security, which is a consulting firm, it does security consulting, for, from the let's see, time period of January 1st to August of this year, of all the sites they scanned, of all the educational sites, 88% of the educational sites had either high or vulnerable exploits in their site. We just saw that 60% of those critical are cross-site scripting, so that's still a huge number of higher ed websites are vulnerable <coughs> cross-site scripting. So what are some of the dangers of cross-site scripting? Again, cross-site scripting is usually just the first step in a much larger attack. Right? It's, again, trying to trick your users that trust your site into do, go into that page that's, that's owned by the attacker and then maybe uh, phishing, gathering up some information for identity theft, collecting email addresses for spamming. Um, and the, one of the real dangers is it's platform independent. It's completely platform independent. It doesn't matter if you're on a Mac, a Linux machine, or yeah, it doesn't matter what platform you're on as far as an OS, it all runs within the browser. So man, how many of you have heard about the talks about the browser becoming the next OS? Yeah, well, that's actually kind of dangerous because it's platform independent. If everybody's got a browser and that's the next OS, well, if you find an exploit in the browser on a page, it spreads like crazy. How many of you remember Sammy that hit MySpace a couple of years ago? Yeah, all right. Was it was over a million users were were exploited within a couple hours. And so it spreads incredibly fast. And we don't have malware scanners on our browsers, at least not yet. So that stuff can just spread like wildfire. So it spreads much, much faster. Um, we can do JAR exploits, which are getting cleaned up. JAR, JAR is a Java file. There was actually some exploits you could do where you could launch an attack through a website, through a vulnerable cross-site scripting website, into a JAR file. And then the jar file would pass back over that exploit back into the system to launch programs within the context of the user that's logged in. So we could actually launch your calculator as you, all through a website, all through cross-site scripting vulnerability. All right, so huge problems. And the last of my favorites, whatever your DB single might come up with. Right, whatever you can think of, once your script is on the page, you own the page. You can record every click. You can report every keystroke. You can take them anywhere you want them to go. You can make them believe anything you want them to believe. All right. Why is it so dangerous to higher education? Because people trust our sites. All right. As an example, my wife is a biology and chemistry teacher at a high school. And the other night she was reading papers and wrote about it. And the subject of Wikipedia came up. Because every once in a while she'll have a student who tries to use Wikipedia as a reference. I said, well, how do you handle that? How do you, do you actually go out to every website they reference and check to make sure it's legit? She said, no, no, usually what we do is we, we give them a list. They're supposed to go there. Or if it's an EDU and the content looks okay, yeah, we'll trust them. So right there, people trust EDU websites. In fact, at least until recently, Google gave EDU, the EDU domain a higher page rate because the EDU domain is locked down. Not just everybody can get one. So people trust your sites, and that's why we're so incredibly important to attackers. Because if they can get, they can find an EDU that has an exploit, they can use that to trick additional users. Now you might be saying, okay, well, my users, bulk of my users, we trained them. They know, they know what to look for. We trained them as best we can. This report just came out two weeks ago. North Carolina State University did a study what they did is they sat people down, they had them working on their computer, had a browser up, browsing a little bit, do some work. And every once in a while, they would send in a fake pop-up. All right? Like, everybody clicked on it. And they said, okay, something's got to be wrong. So they went back and they said, okay, you're going to be working, you're going to have your browser up, you're going to be moving around, and occasionally, we're going to send you some fake pop-ups. All right? That's going to have malware. So you want to be really careful what you click on. And despite the warning, 63% of them, are, they hit the OK button 63% of the time. Despite being warned that some of these are going to be bad, they did it anyway. <coughs> Again, if somebody can get on your site, do a vulnerability, people just click on everything, they're going to be able to get, they're going to be able to get to your users. Alright, so there's three types of cross-site scripting. First is called non-persistent or reflective. It's the most common, and the exploit only lives as long as the user is at that URL. Right, so again, it does nothing to your server. You won't even know anything happened unless you're looking back over the server logs. Right, so 
only lasts as long as they're there. But it relies completely on social engineering. In other words, I have got to trick you. I've got to trick your users into going to that link so I can launch that exploit. All right? The second type is persistent or stored. This exploit actually gets stored somewhere in the database or some other data storage and then replayed back to everybody that comes to the web page. It's much more dangerous. And it's usually common on web forums and social sites. The last is called local, and that's that jar I was talking about. It's less likely to still dangerous. Less likely because you kind of have to know the file paths and the files you're trying to attack. So you have to really know the system those people are on. All right, so I'm going to give you some examples, and then we're going to do live demos. Now, I know I'm talking. I drink all of my coffee that I normally drink in four hours in about 30 minutes, so I can talk faster. But if I am talking too fast or if I've skipped over and something's not clear, just let me know. We're just, I'm just going to give you some verbal examples, and we're going to go back and do some live examples. All right, so OPA. OPA is the code name for the University of Missouri's online job application system. It's just easier to say OPA. And if I say paw print, that's what we call our single sign-on IDs. So as I go through this example, we'll just name So at our online job application system, applicants have to register. And then they store sensitive data. They store uh, addresses, previous work history, social security numbers, phone numbers, etc. All the information that anybody would ever need to be able to do some identity theft. All right, Sean happens to find a reflective cross-site scripting vulnerability. And now what Sean's going to do is he's going to attempt to trick Jane into going to that URL. So maybe he says, hey, you know, I found this job. It sounds great for you. I know you want a new change job. It's perfect. So he sends that to her in an email or maybe IM or Twitter or something, and she heads over. That's reflective, so that means the payload, the actual exploit, is in the URL. And it comes up as soon as she's there. And if she's already logged in or if she attempts to log in, because we control that page, we can gather up all that information and send it back all site. If she's already logged in, I can grab her cookie ID. And if, my, if the site's vulnerable to cross-site request forgeries, I can take over her session and get all the data. Look at me, blank stares. Does that make sense, or are you just really scared at this point? <laughs> I am talking really fast. So I, you can tell me to slow down, because i got the coffee and the nerves. But again, we're going to do live demos, too, so you'll be able to see it even more in depth. Am I good on reflective so far? Got a pretty good idea what it is? All right, persistent. Let's say that OPA also has a web form that's susceptible to cross-site injection. Sean finds out about this. He creates a thread, embeds that exploit in there. And typically, they're usually inflammatory statements. So what you're trying to do is get as many people to come here. So he's going to say something just really outrageous to try to get people to come. And so Jane comes over, she uses the thread, and because that injection is coming from the web server, as far as the browser, as far as it's concerned, it's okay. Bypasses that same origin policy. And we can now send, again, all that data back to the attacker. But it's not just Jane, it's everybody. Anybody that goes to that web page is going to have the same thing happen to them. Over and over and over again, it's just somebody <laughs> finds out and removes that exploit. Okay, good? All right, local. Local's a little bit hard. Let's say Jane does this compromised site that has local based cross site scripting. So the malicious JavaScript on the page is going to launch an attack against an HTML page on Jane's machine. How many of you have noticed that a lot of programs nowadays, their help files, are actually HTML pages? Yeah, all the Windows help, all those. Yep, everything. A lot of pages now are HTML pages, help files. So all you have to do is find one of those that are vulnerable, and if you know the path, you can actually have the browser launch those pages, inject into that page, and the dangerous part about this is that page is on the local machine and runs within the context of the user logged in. So now the script is running as you and can do anything else in your computer that you can do. Again, very dangerous, but less likely because you have to know what platform they're on, you have to do the file pass, etc. Still dangerous, just less likely. Right, any questions before we actually do the live demos? I know it's what everybody's here for. Any questions at all? No? Okay, I will warn you. That penetration testing on somebody else's website is a legal gray area. It is currently illegal in Germany. In the U.S., it has not been tested. So I strongly recommend that you do not go out and start trying to do this on other people's websites. <laughs> All right. 
The websites I'm going to show you have either had the exploit published and the vendor notified for well over a year, or I have talked to the owner and gotten an okay. I don't see Jason in here. Or not. <laughs> Jason Woodward from Cornell? No, he's not in here. Okay. He said I could show this. All right, so just to let you know. All right, so I'm going to go over to my windows. Oh, let's hope this is working. I guess I'll go back. Okay. How many of you would probably trust a link from NBC.com? NBC.com is a pretty well-known website, right? All right, so let's head over to NBC.com. NBC search. There we go. Nothing. Maybe it's not. There we go. All right, so this is what happens. An attacker will go in and do some reconnaissance. And the reconnaissance he's going to do, or she's going to do, is going to try to find out how the web application handles information. So they usually use some string of different characters and some type of keyword to help them find that information when the page comes back. Right? If you look in your server logs and you see APX, I visit it. Okay? And I did do a quick little survey before I came here to the, to the conference, and six out of ten of you had cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Now, if I found your website and had cross with you, I'll be contacting you before the conference is over to share that information with you. But I just wanted to get a feel. Is it really as bad as all the stats? Yeah, yeah, it kind of is. All right, so let's go ahead and hit search and see what happens. Okay, so it comes back. This is pretty typical. It says search results for and then the string I put. You see that all the time. You hit, you know, search at Google. It comes back and says, here's what you search for. All right, well, what we want to do is we want to see what actually came back in the source. Can everybody see that? I'm going to make it a little bigger. Is that good in the back? Okay. So I'm going to say, all right, find that ADS. All right, so it looks like it's putting it in some JavaScript. But it's escaped the quote, so I'm, you know, maybe I can try to play and escape the escape and try to get through there, but that doesn't look too good. So let's see what else is happening. Uh, there's that one. URL, URL encoder and things. I'm not keeping doing things in there, but if I see that, what did they do? What's that? They did a comparison, but what did they leave? When they put the data back into the page, the information, they didn't anything, did they? They just put it back in verbatim. Right, that's the first sign. I see that and I'm like, ah, oh, please. Okay, let's try something. All right, so I'm going to go back here. And notice the URL still. It just says app search. So what method for this form is it using? What's that? Get or post, oh, right? Because there's nothing in the URL. I did a search. There's nothing in the URL. All right, so let's try this. Let's say, all right, script. Alerts. Let's be real basic. Let's see what happens. <laughs> All right, so let's look in the page source. And let's see if we can find that. That was my big one. Probably lots of moves. Let's do something a little bit better. Let's look for script. Yeah, let's try script. I should use a better keyword in there. Send them a URL to this page and actually run my attack. Yeah, I mean, there's some JavaScript you could do if I could find another site that's exploited. I could have it post the data over here, but I can't just send them to NBC.com at this point and have the attack run because there's nothing in the URL. I haven't been able to put it in. How many of you use Firebug and Web Developer in Firefox? Do you ever mess around with the forms piece? All right, what's one of the things you can do with the forms piece? Yep, you can change the post to get. So that's the next thing you do. You go, all right, I'm going to change the post to get. And I'm going to try that same attack. And if I'm lucky, I'll get it in the URL. Attack runs again, and what's in the URL? Oops, let's go over here so you can see it. Now, 
I can post that to a user and get them to come here. And I know some of you might be thinking, Ooh, a pop-up. <laughs> this is all you need. Once you know you can do this, you know you can do anything. And I'll show you in a second. But you see how dangerous this is? Now, post isn't the answer either. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to change everything always to post. Because all I have to do is find another site that's vulnerable, create a link to your website, and behind that link, put JavaScript that will post the data first. So again, just because you change everything to post, it doesn't mean you're safe. I'm going to show you another one. This is Cornell. Everybody familiar with Cornell? Again, yeah, higher, higher education institution, very well known, high level of trust among users. All right, we're going to do the same type of attack. We're going to go through the search bar. Now, I will tell you the pages is not vulnerable. People is. <laughs> okay, we're going to use the same little string. Now, the search. Anyway, it's kind of hard to see. You might not be able to see it, but I look up at the search box. And can you see what happened? Can you see it? My string is kind of hanging out there. Let's find it. Can you see what happened? Hold up here with the car. Remember buffer overflows from a couple years ago? Yeah. Okay. It's a real simple, very reduced explanation, but essentially in a buffer overflow, you're trying to overflow the little area that's contained for your code. You're trying to spill out into another area where your code can execute. And that's kind of what we've done here. We've said, he's just put in, or she has just put in verbatim what we put into the search feature. And so what I did is I put a quote there, and that has essentially ended what should be invalid. And now all my stuff is spilling out or overflowing into the rest of the page. So I'm going to show you another one. This one's a little worse. I got this one saved, so I didn't have to type it all out. So you can do this kind of stuff. Same exact attack. Face <laughs> 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 to face it. All right. In this case, you can't. I'm sorry, the screen's kind of small. Can't quite see it, but I have loaded in a JavaScript file. You see up here, we have JavaScript source from xssed.net. Xssed is a group that records uh, sites that have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and then works with the vendors to correct those. And so that's another thing I always do. I never use my own scripts because I don't want to come back to me and mad. They go to there, there's an automatic warning. If you are a website owner, here's what you need to know. And then they start working with you. But I can control the page. I have got my script to load. I now own the page. Completely. It is mine. I can do. If you've done JavaScript development, you know once you've got access to the DOM, you own it. You can do anything you want. Yes? Just a little clarification. This is only going to work for the person who you send that link to. Correct. So this one. No, this one. No other users are vulnerable. You really haven't affected the web page at all. You've only affected the web page as far as that one user exactly. sees it. Yes, and that is that is reflective across that script. Reflective is only for the user that goes there. The website itself, not affected at all. And again, if you don't check your, your logs, you'll never know what happened. You, just, you won't have any idea. Until they call you up and say, Until they call your you page is given me this. Exactly. I see what's going on with this. When I'm down to 15 minutes left, can somebody yell? Okay, just want to make sure. All right, let's do. Let's, hold on. let's do now a store. Launch this. All right, so this is kind of just a little example, real basic, kind of like Twitter. You put a little comment, you hit leave a comment, and it post, it post the previous comments. Okay, so this is just a this is a persistent demo. Again, we do the same thing. We say, all right, start out with the same little keystrokes, keywords in here. I need my comment. It shows up down here. Source. There we go. Again, what's this application doing? Spitting it out verbatim again, right? So what am I most likely going to be able to do? 
inject scripts in there. All right, so let's try that. Inject other stuff too. I could probably put something right after the script tag to make it look like something. But the real danger here is it is live no matter what. So if I open up IE, Some layers that you can use. One is input filtering. It's also known as blacklisting. 
So you can go in and you can say, okay, well, if I see a less than symbol, I'm just going to remove it. But what's the problem with doing that as a single defense? Exactly. There's totally legitimate reasons why you might want to allow some of that anyway. In addition, how many different character sets are there? Lots of different character sets. So if I can somehow manipulate your page to allow UTF-7, well, then I can inject UTF-7 less than. And now I'm back to where I was again. All right? Blacklisting is always like chasing your tail. You're just going to keep going and going and going. You're never going to be able to keep up. It's okay as, as one part of a multiple-layered system, but it can't be the only one that you use. The next one, the one that I stress highly, is input validation. You have to, input, you have to validate that input that you're receiving. So if you're asking for a social security number, what should be in a social security number? Numbers and how many numbers? Nine. No more, no less, all numbers. So that's all you allow. You say, okay, if it's longer than nine, the character, the character length is longer than nine, spit it out. If it's not all numbers, spit it out. For everything that you can possibly validate, do. Right? And don't and I had a user once who said who I injected through a drop-down list. Because, you know, if you've used the, the web developer toolbar, you can change those drop-down lists to text inputs. So how did you do that? I have a drop-down list. It doesn't matter. You can't control the client side once it released, once it's gone from your server. The user controls it. So even those, you have to validate. At least with the drop-down list, you should have an array or a list of possible values and then compare them against them. So input validation. The next one is output encoding. So for those symbols that you should allow, Maybe like a less than, especially if it's like in a math thing. Then out, when you output that data back to the browser, encode everything into their HTML entities. Because if it's an angry, if it's an ampersand GT colon, I can't do anything with that as an attacker. Because it's not actual execute, executable code. It's just a symbol. The next one you, the next one you can do is called an intrusion detection system. It's also known as a web application firewall. There was some controversy with those for a while because people thought they were the, the be-all, end-all of your solution, and they're not. They're just another layer, but they are handy. I do want to show you a quick demo of one so you have a better idea of what it does. Now, this one happens to be for PHP. It's called PHP IDS. Um, it's an intrusion detection system. What it's going to do is it's going to evaluate all the posts, all the gets, and try to determine if an attack is coming in. And then it scores it. So I'm going to put an attack here real quick so you can just kind of see. This is all right. Injection found. Lists out the rules and then scores each of the rules of that attack and by down at the bottom, it gives me an overall impact. And that's all it does. It just evaluates the incoming data and says, okay, this is what I found. These are the rules that it has violated that are common with attacks, and here's a score. From there, you can do whatever you want. You can say, okay, you know, anything more than 10 is a definite attack, and I'm going to block you as best you can. Or you can simply sort of a session and say, okay, well, maybe you weren't really, but if you bump over 25, it's full, then I'm going to kick you out. But again, it's just another layer because if, it, if an attacker tries to inject and hits this and you're blocking them, well, now they've got to go get another IP and then they come back and they've got to get through all your other layers. So again, it's just more layers on top of each other. Something else that you can do is called the tidy output. Anybody heard of HTML purifier? A couple of you? It simply takes input, HTML input, evaluates it, and then purifies it back to some doc type. So let's say I've got uh, div id equals blog, and then put an input text, and then I end it with a paragraph. Really bad, really bad HTML, right? You know, I, didn't, I didn't start it with a quote, but I've ended it with a quote, you know, and ending with did with a paragraph instead. I say, all right, you know, I want this to be XHTML when transition. Submit that, and HTML title will take it, convert it back to. So if you've got stuff, if you've got characters you need people to enter, or you've got maybe a, a section where you're allowing them to do some basic HTML, 
you can use this to at least make sure that what they've entered is valid HTML. Because if it gets a double quote in there, you know, I'm trying to break out of that double quote area, it's not going to allow it. It's going to correct that and fix it. Yes? I'm sorry, say that again? Yes. Yes. At least for the PHP one, I know there's a .NET one. Um, I don't know about any of the other languages, but they have an offshoot for .NET as well. All right. Any other questions? There's also anti-SAMI. Anti-SAMI was born out of the SAMI attack, my SAMI attack on MySpace. It is kind of like the HTML purifier. Again, it's, it's allowing uh, HTML to come in and actually be valid and then making sure there's no attacks embedded. So again, another piece that you can add, another layer that you can add to that security. I actually finished. Wow. That was all fast. I apologize for that. So I think how many? We got five minutes left. Five minutes. So five questions. Any questions? Yes. Lots of regular expressions. Tidy the output. I, it's hard. That that is a hard one when you're trying to allow them to do actual HTML, and that's why the BB code is so popular, because then you can convert it, you can kind of control it. That's even injectable, but it's not easy. It is difficult. You just have to make sure that what they're putting in is what you want to allow them to do. And I definitely check out anti sami because that is specifically what that is designed to do. Yes. And, and that is exactly why they do it that way. Because it's easier to say, okay, if I'm going to format my HTML this way, then I know what I should be getting, and then I can convert it over to HTML. You got a question? Ooh, I don't know about log files because I'm not a sysadmin. Um, there are tools though that you can use. Um, one is the XSSME. What this will do is it'll run full collection of cross-site scripting attacks against every form possible in a page. And then give you those results. It's a little Firefox extension. Um, there's also something called Hackbar. So not only will it do cross-site scripting, it'll also do MSQL, MySQL. No but also doing codings so that you can attack. And again, you're not supposed to attack anybody else's site, only your site. <laughs> With your system admin approved. Yes? What day were you talking about? What day was I doing what? You're local, so I can look at my logs. Uh, it was over the last two weeks, essentially. Again, if I found one, I, I'll contact you for sure. No, did you guys? I know there's tools to search in logs. I, I just don't do system administration, so I don't usually have to go back over the logs. That's true, too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not real well versed in the logs, because I'm lucky enough I don't have to mess with any system administration. I think related, but more dangerous, is SQL injection. And if, if you guys are scared of this, yeah. I mean, that's something you should be more scared of, because that affects your servers. I can permanently yes. um, deface your site forever and forever. Yes, exactly. Yeah, SQL injection is even worse. And the same strings that you saw me using is used in SQL injection because you usually do your qualifiers with double quotes or single quotes. But at least with SQL servers, you know, most of those now they've got some type of binding or encapsulation. So that they, the vendors have tried to lessen that attack, but they're still extremely dangerous. In fact. I found one site, and I won't say who it was, that actually dumped out the SQL statements in their comments as you ran searches. So now you've got table names, field names, all that stuff. And click, yeah, clickjack is a whole yeah. other thing that lays, you, you do cross-site scripting, you lay another div <coughs> on top of a page, you make the bottom page translucent, and then put things for the user to click on, but they're actually clicking on the stuff below. 
yes, so you can bring up their bank site in the background. They click transfer funds, even though they think they're clicking something else, and they hit you know submit. And they think they're posting a comment on Twitter, but they're actually just transferring money to you. Yeah, scoop check this one too. Web server firewalls, our firewalls. Again, you can use it as a layer, but I wouldn't depend on it 100%. It, it depends on the web server's firewall because it doesn't analyze the SSL traffic, does it? Does it? Okay. I, it's just another layer that you can use. I wouldn't trust it because, again, you're never going to fully stop somebody from attacking you and getting through if they are determined. You can only make it cumbersome. Yes? This question's already been answered. Some questions have already been answered, but what is the most important thing I'd say output encoding. I had to just name one. If you can only do one today, I'd say output encoding. Because at least then you're you're limiting a big bulk. In PHP, it's just a function. It takes, say, take my string and then convert it into HTML entities. Um, I don't remember what it is in .NET off the top of my head. But so anything output the string pass it to Yes. Yeah, it just... Correct. Oh, HTML.net. Another thing is, if you're going to the WordPress thing today, Word, I love open source stuff. I do. I really do. I really, really do. But some of that stuff, especially WordPress, is really bad about these injections. And I don't want to. I don't want to ding against them, but you've got people who aren't real. I don't want to say real programmers. That aren't security experts necessarily programming this stuff, and they haven't thought about these things. So if you install WordPress and they start plugging in all these different plugins and modules and not checking the code, you have no idea what you just allowed. At 2.6.2, it's solid right now, but 2.6.1 had a remote injection vulnerable vulnerability where I could take over the admin password. And then lock everybody out. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad product. Just make sure you stay on top of the updates. I mean, WordPress MU, which is supposed to be a little bit more secure, just came out with a whole bunch of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So, yeah, one of the problems with open source is that all the attackers can open it up and take a look. So, it, it, it's it's a great product to use. Just make sure you stay on top of the updates and you and you harden it up as much as possible. Oh, that's all we got for today.